in part two of this series on modality with possibility and necessity being the key ideas, we are going to be looking at the logic of modality and some challenges to the idea that you could take these things seriously and then how uh, people responded with discussions of possible worlds and their relevance. So first of all, the logic of modality. Now there are a couple of ways of approaching this, um, but both have to do with possible world semantics. So Alvin Plantinga would represent one major branch of how to approach possible worlds, and David Lewis would re represent another major branch of how we are talking about possible worlds. But let's make sure we understand what possible worlds are, and why they're relevant here before we take this too far. Okay, both of these people uh, take seriously this distinction between ne necessary truths and contingent truths and use possible worlds in order to make sense of that distinction. So it does seem to make sense to say that some things are necessarily true and some things are contingently true as we discussed in part one. So, Planiga and Lewis would both agree with this as a starting point, that there are many ways that things could have been other than the way they are now. So for example, I could have been wearing a red shirt as I record this, which I'm not. Um, I could have been a pharmacist, which I'm not. Those things seem to be uh, possibilities uh, for me, uh, one a little bit more significant than the other. Okay, so what are possible worlds? Possible worlds are ways that things could have been. Uh, one way of thinking of this, ways that things could have been, are possible states of affairs. See, these are not actualized necessarily, but could have been actualized. So these things are not necessarily the case, but they could have been the case. So a possible world then is a maximal possible state of affairs, a state of affairs such that it either includes or it excludes every possibility. Everything is accounted for when you're talking about a possible world. So it's, it's a maximal state of affairs in that sense. Okay, so how do we talk about possible worlds? How is this useful when we're talking about modality? Well, you can provide this logical system such that if a proposition is necessarily true, of course, cannot possibly be false, right? That means that it is true in every possible world. So you could say for any possible world, W, P, is true in W. That means that P is a necessary truth. And if a proposition is possibly true, it is going to be true in some possible world, right? At least one possible world, W, it is the case that P is true in W. And if a proposition is necessarily false, well, that means it's false in every single possible world. There is no possible world W such that P is true in W. Okay, so now we have necessarily true, possibly true, necessarily false, and we've cashed out those meanings in terms of possible worlds. And to go on with this idea, if we include possible worlds in our ontology, Right, say that these things exist, we will have vast resources to address various metaphysical problems and themes, really important things such as personal identity over time, um, freedom, problems related to the existence of God. So this is used in the ontological argument, the problem of evil and how people might respond to the problem of evil. And there are all kinds of other metaphysical themes that are relevant that, that possible worlds helps us to make sense of these really significant questions in metaphysics. And that's why we use possible worlds. That's why this is important 
because these really important ideas in metaphysics can be addressed with the use of possible worlds. And we might even call people who do this possible worlds metaphysicians. So possible worlds metaphysicians claim that these possible worlds are not bizarre imaginary creations of metaphysics, but they are explications of our normal thinking about ways things could have been. So we often think, well, things didn't have to turn out that way. What do we mean when we say that? This is a, a way of explaining what we mean. Okay, in order to do possible world semantics, we need to make a distinction here between de dicto and de re necessity. And this is an important distinction, this difference between the two. And so it's important to make sure that we're clear on these. Now, so far up to this point, we've been talking about necessary truths or possible things that are true. And these are truths that we might call de dicta. These are truths of the statement, to be a bit more literal with the Latin. But there is also a metaphysical necessity or necessity de re, and this would be of the thing itself. So just as propositions may be true or false in possible worlds, objects may exist or fail to exist in possible worlds. So horses exist in some possible worlds, but not others. Unicorns exist in some possible worlds, but not the one that's been actualized, right? Not in our world. And objects may exist with or without certain properties in possible worlds. So for example, uh, Bill Clinton may exist in a possible world and may not have been president of the United States, right? So it makes sense to say, yeah, Bill Clinton could have lived without being president. Well, that means there's a possible world in which Bill Clinton lives and was never president. Now, this, this may make sense, and it certainly does to many, uh, but there are challenges to de re and de dicto modality, but especially, this, especially de re uh, modality. And so in the 20th century, there were many people who argued against the legitimacy of possible worlds and modality uh, based on this legitimacy of the de re and de dicto distinction. So they thought that, well, it doesn't make sense to say of Bill Clinton that he could have been president or not president in a possible world, these kinds of concerns. And the thesis is that modality simply depends entirely on our language about things. Whether something is possible or necessary, it just depends on our language and what we're interested in. It's not an actual feature of anything that exists in the world. So there is no such thing as metaphysical necessity. And Quine, W.V.O. Quine, was one of the most prominent critics of modality and this idea that there is necessity when we're talking about objects and things and people. So Quine said objects have essential properties only relative to a certain frame of reference, or only relative to a way of referring to an object. And if that's the case, this de re de, de dicto distinction doesn't make sense. And worse, of course, there's no logic of modality, so you have to leave it out of your metaphysics. Let's look at the argument more carefully. So Quine said, let's think about two claims. So this is uh, Quine's argument, right? Necessarily, all bicyclists are bipedal. And let's just grant that for the sake of his argument. So both sides can grant that. Uh, all bicyclists have two feet. Uh, necessarily, all mathematicians are rational. And again, of course, it de for term depends on your definition of rational, but let's grant that one as well, right? The ability to do, to do math, uh, being rational is a requirement of that. So necessarily all mathematicians are rational. So these two statements seem to make sense. 
Okay, but it's not necessary that all mathematicians are bipedal, and that seems to make sense. Well, what about the mathematical cyclist? So here, it seems there are problematic questions, right? Is the mathematical cyclist necessarily bipedal? Is he necessarily rational? Is he both? Is he neither, right? No answer seems to be satisfactory. So as, as a person is a cyclist, from that frame of reference, he's necessarily bipedal. But as a mathematician, he's necessarily rational, but not necessarily bipedal. And if you don't have an answer to these kinds of questions, then it's all a matter of language and de re modality does not make any sense. And so we have to do away with that when we're doing our metaphysics. Now I wanna talk about Alvin Plantinga's response to Quine's argument here. And roughly speaking, big picture, Quine equivocates on the very issue he's arguing against. So here's the problem. Quine equivocates equivocates between uh, these two claims. When he says necessarily all bicyclists are bipedal, well, that's one way of saying it. But then when he goes on to his argument, it sounds, it looks like he's saying all bicyclists are necessarily bipedal. But those are two different things, right? The, the first claim does not entail the second claim. And so Quine's claim of inconsistency and the incoherence of modality fails, right? As an alternative uh, illustration, right? We can grant that necessarily all NBA players are professional athletes, okay? That makes sense. Uh, that is a necessary truth. All NBA players are professional athletes. But that is a very different claim from saying that all NBA players are necessarily professional athletes, right? The first is a claim about what's necessary in regards to the statement. The second is a claim about what's necessary in regards to the individual person that we might be talking about. Let's run through this one more time with a different illustration. Okay, so suppose that Stephen Hawking is contemplating the number four. It is true that the thing Stephen Hawking is thinking about is an even number. Okay, so that's true. Now, is it necessarily true? Well, taken de dicto, it's not, right? Stephen Hawking could have been thinking about the number seven, okay? But taken de re, it is necessarily true. When we're talking about the number four itself, that thing is an even number. That is a necessary truth. Okay, so there is this legitimate distinction between the two. Just one more example before we proceed. Okay, th consider this statement, whoever is sitting is sitting. The statement is necessarily true. So de dicto, we can say necessarily whoever is sitting is sitting. But the person who's sitting isn't necessarily sitting. So taken de re, when you're talking about the person, that's not necessarily true. So whoever is sitting is not necessarily sitting, okay? So we have this distinction between de re and de dicto claims, and that is a response to Quine's argument, and that adds legitimacy to modal talk, uh, modality in terms of metaphysics. And so essentialists, uh, just a few names here, for example, Michael Locks, uh, David Lewis, Alvin Plantinga, whom we've already mentioned, essentialists hold that some objects have both essential properties and non-essential or contingent properties. And so we can explicate this in terms of possible worlds. 
right? To say that an object X has a property P essentially is to say that X has P in the actual world, the one that exists, and in every possible world in which X exists. Of course, X doesn't have to exist in every possible world, but this means if it's an essential property that every possible world in which X does exist, X has the property P. So, Michael Jordan played for the Bulls in the actual world, but not in every possible world in which he exists. So it seems possible that he never played for the Bulls. Maybe he played for the Lakers his entire career in some possible world. That seems possible, right? So he played for the Bulls in the actual world, not in every possible world in which he exists. So this is a contingent truth and not a necessary truth. So playing for the Bulls is a contingent property of Michael Jordan. That makes sense. But Michael Jordan is a person in every possible world in which he exists. There is no possible world in which Michael Jordan is a chair. Now, there are arguments about this. You could go back and forth. But a person seems to be an essential property of Michael Jordan. And we can say that by saying that Michael Jordan is a personal person in every possible world in which he exists. Okay, so we have possible world semantics. We're setting up the, the possible world semantics. We've given some insight in how this works. And there appears to be this really tight connection between de dicto statements and de re modality and possible world semantics. How can we describe this connection? Well, we can do this in different ways depending on what we say possible worlds are. So uh, David Lewis is a nominalist uh, or a concretist, as some people might say. He's a possibilist. Alvin Plantinga is a realist or an abstractionist. He thinks that possible worlds are abstract, but they do exist. He is an actualist. These views about what possible worlds are after our distinctions here can vary widely. So this broad agreement about possible world semantics that helps us make sense of modality. There is commonality among metaphysicians on that, the things that we've covered in this video. From here on though, we can talk about possible worlds in different ways let's get at the nature of possible worlds. Well, that's going to need uh, some more videos to cover that.